Welcome. You're listening to Ask the Doulas, a podcast where we talk to experts from all over the country about topics related to pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and early parenting. Let's chat. Hello, this is Kristen Revere with Ask the Doulas, and I am so excited to chat with Josh Deck today. Josh is a podcaster as well. His podcast is named Reversible, the ultimate gut health podcast. He's also an ex-paramedic and a holistic nutritionist specializing in gut health. Welcome, Josh. Kristen, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So I would love to hear a bit of your, you know, backstory and why your focus and passion on gut health emerged from all of the different, you know, focuses you could have in holistic nutrition and holistic health. Sure. And I call it more of a, an obsession than I would anything else at this stage in my career. So I'll give you the kind of the quick Cole's notes here. So I used to be a paramedic and I realized very quickly it was just sick care. You pick up the same people over and over for a lot of the same issues and you take them to the hospital, they get new medications or more of the same medication. You send them back home. And I really became a glorified taxi for the ill. And it's not what I wanted to do. I enjoy doing trauma and stuff like that, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. People weren't getting better. And so through a series of events and happy accidents, I ended up getting into personal training. Okay. And when I was it's probably 20, 21, one of my clients came to see me first. One of my first clients there, my professional personal training career, she was 57 years old. She was on 17 pills and insulin with breakfast, nine pills and insulin for bedtime. She had high blood pressure, slept with a CPAP machine. She was on her disability list at work. So if the fire department got called, she had to wait 56 floors up for them to come and get her. Wow. Uh, just a whole mess of, of things going on. And by the time she turned 59, we're working together on health and nutrition and gut and fitness and training at age 59 coming from this background, she ended up breaking her first world record in the raw powerlifting division as a weightlifter. What? And so, oh yeah, this 59 year old woman kept breaking records until she was 61, 62. And she retired um, five foot, nothing, 160 pounds. And she's pulling 315 plus pounds off the floor. Amazing. So, it was incredible to see. And that was really my first window there, Kristen, into seeing that the human body has so much more potential and capability to heal itself. And so I got interested in that holistic side. And I started seeing people in my personal training space with skin issues, anxiety, depression, hormonal issues, started doing some self-study, found some mentorship, started, you know, working with and learning from different doctors. And I decided ultimately go back to school, become a nutritionist and the holistic nutrition kicked things off. I started seeing gut disease and gut issues and severe IBS until my career eventually landed specifically in inflammatory bowel disease, which is Crohn's and colitis or ulcerative colitis, where I work now. And through the work we've done there, I've been recruited since to the Priority Health Academy as a medical lecturer. And that's sort of where my career is today. I love it. So as a paramedic, I have a, a side question for you. Did you um, support any unexpected home births or were, what was your experience with women in childbirth as a paramedic? So I had a few OB patients that we had seen, you know, I got some OBs more so when I was actually doing my preceptorship before I was okay. a full fledged paramedic and student, the odd MVC or motor vehicle collision that we would see with obstetrics. And thankfully everybody was fine and healthy, nothing major. Yeah. I did a little bit of a, a short stint there in the OB ward as well through clinical and through hospital placement. We work in the ER, we work in dialysis, we work in OB. So we get to kind of see everything. And I really found obstetrics fascinating. And it was through actually my career in the holistic side, helping women with fertility or men with fertility issues that really sort of highlighted the importance of the gut to me in every aspect of our being and well-being. And looking back now at my clinical and the stuff that I could actually see, I can see these gut connections and these chronic disease things that people started to have. So it's a really cool 360 moment. It really is. I love it. And I also appreciate that you mentioned um, working with men in fertility issues because it often, you know, is connected to the woman um, mm -hmm. as far as any issues with conception. So and focusing on gut health for both would be so beneficial preconception or in that fertility stage of starting um, treatments and so on. Oh, absolutely. And there's so much incredible things that happen with the gut to set things up for both pre, peri and postnatal. And it's really amazing when we make that connection, but it's, it's just like you said, I think through a lot of history, fertility issues have been connected with women. Oh, she's barren. Oh, she's this, she's that. But never really look at the men who might have low T or low sperm motility or digestive issues or dietary issues. And we never really look at both sides of that picture. And I think it's about time. 
I agree completely. <laughs> so what are your tips for our listeners um, in each stage, whether it's preconception, early pregnancy to focus on, you know, maximizing gut health, and then also in the postnatal recovery phase? So I would actually love to go through these step by step. Why don't we start with preconception and we'll work our way through early pregnancy, perinatal, postnatal, and just kind of talk about the role of these, these guts and these gut bacteria. So let's start things from the top. I think first, it's really, really important to understand for the listeners how important our guts really are. Because oftentimes we hear kind of in mainstream, right? We hear, oh, gut health this, gut health that. Yeah, okay, I get it. But I think it's really important to understand a reverence for gut health. Because in my practice, I often tell my clients, our gut bacteria are more important than our very own DNA and our very own genetics, which is a huge claim to make. Realistically, we're talking the foundation that makes a human being a human being, but that's actually being broken. So to give you an idea, Kristen, if we take a look at the gut microbes, right, our microbiome, right. we have about 10 trillion cells in the human body. Your gut microbiome alone has about 100 trillion different bacteria. And so they're outnumbering your body's own cells 10 to 1, which is pretty dramatic. And if we look at the genetic material, right, there are millions, 10 or 15, 20 million different bacteria in there multiplied out to 100 trillion. Your own genes, the entire human genome, there's about 23,000 different genes. But looking at your gut bacteria, you have about 3 million different genes. So there's 130 times more genetic material in your gut alone. And so- That's amazing. Oh, it's shocking. It really is astonishing. You know, we dig into what it does for the body, integrates with everything, it integrates with hormonal health, which again, obviously very important for healthy pregnancy and delivery. We like integrates with your hair, skin, nails, sleep, moods, emotion, how social you feel like being, detoxification, vitamin and nutrient production. Like there's so much that they do. There's not a single aspect of your body not influenced in some way by your gut bacteria. And so just to illustrate one, one quick little story, it's one of my favorite stories. The importance of small things. If we look at, I'm sure you're familiar, obviously, as a doula and all your OB clients and interviews you take in, you're probably familiar with toxoplasmosis and the dangers around that. Yes. Okay. So have you had a chance to talk to your listeners about toxoplasma and what it does and how it works in the body? Not that I can recall over the years. So fill us in. Okay. Well, here's a fun little story for you. <laughs> so toxoplasmosis is an infection of a parasite called toxoplasma gondii. And this toxoplasma parasite, this is just to illustrate the importance of small things in the body. Okay. Every, every living thing on earth has a prime directive, right? Grow and pass on its genes. And even this parasite, this toxoplasma parasite knows it has a prime directive. It has to grow, pass on its genes and live its best life, which ultimately is actually in the belly of a cat. And so uh -huh. what we see this toxoplasma doing, right? It's why we can't change kitty litter if you're pregnant because you could have these parasites in the litter and you could ingest them and cause problems. Yes. But this parasite wants to get into mice because it knows mice will end up in the belly of a cat. But interestingly enough, mice are genetically wired. It's in their DNA to fear cats. As a prey animal who's never seen a cat, a baby mouse will still run. And even mice who have never seen a cat who smell cat urine are hardwired to run the other way. And so this parasite actually hijacks this entire living organism. And what it'll do is it'll get into the brain and it'll burn out the dendrites in the fear center of the brain of the mouse, making it no longer afraid of cats, making this mouse very brave. So it increases the likelihood to run into a cat. But it goes one step further. I mean, this will blow you away. It actually rewires the brain to be sexually attracted to the smell of cat urine. What? And so, oh yeah. So this one little <laughs> parasite completely hijacks and rewires a autonomous living organism to get it more likely to end up in the belly of a cat. Now it's not afraid and it seeks cats. And so then this parasite gets consumed. It can go to the belly of a cat where it's happy, but it can also be in any cat, even jungle cats. And so we've even seen humans inside who have this toxoplasma infection. Now, obviously over here, we don't have to worry about cats, but in the Eastern countries, the only predator of a human is going to be lions and tigers and large cats. And so we've even found it in people. Now we talk about bravery. Again, we can often think, well, it's just a mouse, a parasite. It's a small mouse. What's the big deal? We've even seen them hijack humans, kind of like <gasps> uh, the last of us with the cordyceps. And so these little parasites, we found people who are very brave, who jump into traffic to save a human being or a child or run into a burning building to save a stranger. Many of these people have been found to be infested with toxoplasma gondii parasites, making them seem braver than they actually are. And so it's really interesting when we look at what one little thing can do to hijack a host in a living organism. And so I'll often say, 
If one parasite can do this to a mouse or a human being, one little organism, you have a hundred trillion bacteria inside of your gut. Imagine what they can do for you when they're aligned or worse yet, imagine what they can do to you if they're not aligned and they're out of balance. And this ultimately is the importance of gut health prenatal. What an amazing story. It really is one of my favorites. <laughs> so we have to understand that your gut bacteria set up everything for you preconception. They balance your hormones. They keep you healthy. 70 to 90% of your immune system comes from your gut. If you find yourself getting chronically ill or have digestive issues, you're going to be depleted on nutrients. You're not going to be able to have a full nutritional profile, even as a basic level to bring a baby to term or to have healthy sex hormones and sexual function. And so we see a lot of people who have digestive issues who either A, are more prone to having babies with birth defects or developmental delays, or B, may not get pregnant at all or C, not carry a baby to term. And this comes down to nutrient because the body needs nutrients and surplus, obviously when you're pregnant. And so right. in order to have that, you have to have a healthy gut because a healthy gut absorbs and produces nutrients. But if you're not eating well or your gut's unhealthy, you're both you're both going to be in debt because your body is burning through nutrients at an increased rate. Anytime you're under stress or you're inflamed or you're sick, it's burning through these nutrients in excess. And then you're not ingesting or absorbing properly. So now you're in debt. And so what happens when you're in debt? I mean, imagine, Kristen, if you went broke, you went bankrupt. The only way to get money is to work more, work harder or to borrow it. Right. And so the human body does the same. It will borrow from hair, skin, nails, other organ systems, hormones, and all these other aspects that hold nutrients in the body in order to sustain its most vital parts, which is brain, liver, heart, digestion, the basics. And so if you're in debt, you're borrowing from other places, it's no wonder we're going to be so sick all the time and unable to carry or to deliver or to have you know healthy sperm and sperm motility if we're constantly in debt. And so we have to have healthy guts ahead of time to get ourselves to the end goal of obviously conception and development. Thank you for explaining that. I feel like is often assumed that just taking prenatal vitamins and trying to eat healthy is all you need, both in preparing for conception and also during pregnancy. But we often think exactly that because it's often what we're told. It's just, well, right. take these vitamins, you'll be fine. Well, if you have an unhealthy gut, even if you may not think it's unhealthy, if you have skin issues, anxiety, depression, you might actually have an underlying gut issue. And so it's really, you end up with really expensive urine. Because right? they kind of come in, your body can't absorb, utilize, break down, and then they get wasted. Exactly. But worse yet, most doctors will tell, will take this folic acid, right? Just folic acid. Even if we look at genetics, something that's become very popular, and I'm, I'm sure you're very aware of it in this space, is that 44% of the population has a particular SNP in this gene called MTHFR. Exactly. And so, yes. Right. And you talk about that, I'm sure, on yours, right? So 44% of women can't use folic acid anyway. So we need these methyl folates in usable form. So I, I think it's really important to understand all sides of this thing. Exactly like, like you're saying, to really have a well balanced idea of how to have a healthy body, healthy baby, healthy nutrients, not just coming from what you ingest, but how you digest. Yes. So true. And obviously, I mean, it helps to be in, you know, a healthy state before conception. So exercise, water intake, nutrition, mm -hmm. and as you had mentioned, really setting yourself up for conception, but getting into pregnancy. So again, what are your tips once um, a listener is pregnant and wants to focus on their health? Would that be to seek a holistic nutritionist or what are your thoughts there? Definitely. I'm a little biased because I am a holistic nutritionist. And so they definitely seek a nutritionist because they're really great at making sure you're getting what you need. Now, again, not all practitioners are created equally as you're aware in your field as well, like any field. Not all doctors are going to be equal. Not all engineers will be equal. Not all janitors are going to be equal. And exactly. so we really have to vet to make sure you know they're, they're competent. So my specialty being in the gut, I can make those connections, particularly for those who are trying to conceive, who have gut issues or gut disease. But what I won't actually touch, because I specialize in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, I actually will not work with women who are actively pregnant or breastfeeding because the very rare circumstances I will, but if there's a lot of toxins in the body and things built up, flushing those out while you're pregnant or breastfeeding is actually very dangerous for the baby. And that so, makes sense. Yes. With yeah, your right? specialty. Absolutely. Yeah. So we just want to make sure to take care of that first. Now, if you're looking to conceive or you're finished breastfeeding, absolutely, we can get in and fix gut disease. But if you have very basic gut issues, irritable bowel syndrome, if you have some acid reflux, bloat, some cramping, constipation, diarrhea, that can absolutely be managed through very simple processes. Often, we just have to figure out what's causing the problem. 
And so if the issue really is just gut bacteria, sometimes taking the odd probiotic. Now, I'm not condoning taking probiotics randomly. I'll get into that in a sec. But sometimes okay. it can be as simple as a probiotic or sitting down to chew your food. If you're, if you're shuttling five kids in the car to soccer practice and scarfing down dashboard dining, you're actively in fight or flight. So you're not going to break down. You're not going to digest. You're not going to absorb. Your digestive system will be compromised, especially if you're pregnant. All your organs are displaced. And so you're not going to be your digestion's already going to be a little bit off. You might be more prone to being burpy or bloaty or gassy. And so we have to take extra special care to sit, to eat, to breathe. Sometimes digestive enzymes can really help with that. But in the case of taking probiotics, I often caution. Now, the good news here is there's a safety net because most probiotics, oftentimes they're dead in capsule. And so even their postbiotics that they produce can have nice benefits going through. But it's hard to find unless it's a very high quality, maybe refrigerated probiotic. It may not be an active live culture. Right. And so you're kind of okay in that regard. But if someone's adding live cultures, say you have an overgrowth of lactobacillus, very common probiotic we'll see. You have an overgrowth in your gut and that's contributing to your issues. And you take that probiotic, well, now you're pouring gasoline on the fire. And so I often recommend in gut issues, severe gut issues to get GI mapping done, which is a DNA stool analysis of your gut bacteria, which shows us everything in or out of balance. And as much as we can really see, again, we have 20 million different bacteria. The best GI maps can maybe show you a hundred. So it's a grain of sand on a beach, but it's all okay. actionable. Right? We can actually do a lot with these 50 to 100 we can see and make actionable differences. And so, you know, if we want to, if we're looking at gut and just how to generally take care of a gut, unless you have some severe conditions, again, like severe IBS or inflammatory bowel disease, I would say digestive enzyme, pausing, chewing, eating whole foods, and just taking your time. And even might sound crazy, but avoid water 30 minutes before, during, and after meals, sipping as necessary. Because if you're low on stomach acid, which is a very common cause for acid reflux, then you're going to be diluting your digestive enzymes further, which will again further pre prevent or inhibit your digestibility of your foods. Great tip. And so how does this affect baby? And I mean, just overall gut health. And obviously with uh, breastfeeding moms, it, there's a lot of correlation. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the newborn and how gut health affects the child or children if there are multiples? Sure. Something to keep in mind, we often hear gut microbiome, but microbiome is really just an ecosystem, like a neighborhood of bacteria that happen to live in your gut. We have microbiomes everywhere, right? Women actually have them vaginally. So the entire birth canal is coated in bacteria. Yes. You have them in your mouth. You have them in your stomach, your hair, your nails, your eyebrows, and your scalp. It's all different, but these neighborhoods all talk to each other. And so if you have healthy microbes, you have healthy microbiomes in one area, it actually influences beneficially the others. And so if you look at the vaginal microbiome, in the birth canal, healthy gut bacteria influences that directly. And so when the baby is born, this is the difference between obviously natural and C-section. As a baby comes through the birth canal, they're fully inoculated in these bacteria. And having a healthy gut fully influences that bacterium. But even in utero, a baby developing in a placenta, we used to think the placenta was sterile, but we now know it's teeming with microbes that you get from mom who got them from her mom and her mom before that. Exactly. And so these Right. So these genetics are passed on, these genetics and these, these microbe genetics. And so it's really important to have a healthy gut to provide healthy vaginal bacteria and healthy placental bacteria. So as a baby's being born, they're fully inoculated, eyes, nose, mouth, everything with these microbes. Now, for those who might need emergency C-sections, something that's now being explored, I'm sure you've heard about or talked about yourself, is a vaginal swab. And then you cover the baby with that swab and those microbes to try to inoculate as best you can. Yes. The seeding mm. is very popular. And I'm so glad. And a lot of doctors will still say, mm, that's stupid, but we know how important it is. And so, you know, if we look at the importance of having these, these natural births, obviously having a natural birth as best we can, we know babies who are C-section, they commonly, more commonly will develop, you know, respiratory or neurological disorders like autism spectrum, schizophrenia, or autoimmune right. related diseases, right? You might have more asthma or skin issues, juvenile arthritis, celiac, diabetes, or even obesity through childhood if you don't have these bacteria properly. And so to get very important for a healthy childhood. And we've even shown, again, connections to weight loss or the ability to have healthy body weight to gut bacteria on the body in general through mouse studies where they've gone through and put mice, for example, and they've, they've had them go through and they've cleaned out their bacteria through antibiotics and flushing, and they put them on a caloric deficit. Well, these mice with altered bacteria didn't get the benefits from calorie deficits of weight loss or bacterial or hormonal benefits, but the mice who had healthy bacteria did. 
And so then they re-inoculated these mice with the good bacteria from the healthy mice, and they were able to lose weight again and have healthy thyroid and hormones and other things. And so we're still exploring. This is a very new science. We're just bridging into the last 10, 20 years. It'll take us 50 to 100 more to really map the biome. It's amazing what we're getting into to see. And so let, let's take the next step. Baby's been born. They're covered in bacteria, assuming it's healthy, or they've been seeded with vaginal seeding, which is great. And now we have to look at breastfeeding. Right? There are obviously huge risks of not breastfeeding. Again, medically, some women just cannot. And oftentimes it's actually a prenatal issue of gut health and healthy production. But if we look at women who are already developing or already you know, have a baby in utero and they're already given birth and now they want to breastfeed. If you can breastfeed, obviously that's ideal. If you can't, yes. in these cases, it might be recommended to have donor milk because, and this is a really hard stat, again, I've been under fire for this one because it hurts people's feelings. And I'm just talking about the science. There are some medical circumstances. Of course, women cannot give birth vaginally and it's emergency or they cannot breastfeed. And those of are course. the situations we have to do our best. But the reality is if you're able for your baby's health, you should. We know, statistically speaking, babies who are strictly formula fed from birth versus strictly breastfed are twice as likely to die from SIDS. And so it's detrimental to have these gut bacteria. We know they're a huge part of your immune system. We know they're a huge part of development and brain development, heart development. And so obviously having these beneficial microbes the first three days, lots of colostrum, a thick turf being laid down inside the gut and the gut bacteria. But infants not breastfeeding, we can see infectious incidence of uh, increased infectious morbidity. We see elevated risk of childhood obesity, type 1, type 2 diabetes, leukemia, again, SIDS. And even for mothers, a failure to breastfeed, it's a bi-directional relationship. We have a failure to breastfeed is associated with premenopausal breast cancer, ovarian cancer, retained gestational weight, type 2 diabetes, myocardial infarction, and that's heart attack. And so we see all these problems associated with not breastfeeding on both sides. So it's this very natural process. And of course, the oxytocin and the bonding and all those things. And those gut bacteria, the gut is like a meadow, a newly seeded meadow. And if you were to take a meadow, it's just growing grass, brand new patch of dirt, you're just getting grass and little baby plants starting to come in and you light it on fire with drugs or medications or antibiotics, it may never grow back the same again. Right. And so this is the importance of, you know, long-term breastfeeding, 12 months, even some women are doing 24 months, which... I mean, I obviously don't have breasts or a baby, so I can't say if it's too long or not. Some people say it's the best. And so really we have to look at the science behind it. And that lays down this nice thick meadow and a gut bacteria can grow from a meadow to a rainforest if it's seeded properly, if it's taken care of properly, if it's fed properly, if we avoid fire and salt in the soil, you know, antibiotics and medications where possible. And this is how we prevent disease and have healthy lives later on. And even just looking at tribes. You know, a lot of indigenous tribes still living off the land, they don't know what uh, failure to breastfeed is. They don't know what Alzheimer's is. They don't know what diabetes or obesity is because they're all extremely healthy. Their bodies are functioning as they should. And that's sort of the link there between pre, post, peri and all the things. Yes. And you mentioned donations. So milk banks do screenings and mm -hmm. there are different milk sharing groups. So, but we're fortunate to have a milk bank in our area. Hey, Alyssa here. I'm just popping in to tell you about our course called Becoming. Becoming a mother is your guide to a confident pregnancy and birth, all in a convenient six-week online program. From birth plans to sleep training and everything in between, you'll gain the confidence and skills you need for a smooth transition to motherhood. You'll get live coaching calls with Kristen and myself, a bunch of expert videos, including chiropractic care, pelvic floor physical therapy, mental health experts, breastfeeding, and much more. You'll also get a private Facebook community with other mothers going through this at the same time as you to offer support and encouragement when you need it most. And then of course, you'll also have direct email access to me and Kristen, in addition to the live coaching calls. If you'd like to learn more about the course, you can email us at info at goldcoastdoulas.com or check it out at thebecomingcourse.com. We'd love to see you there. Oh, that's amazing. What a gift of technology and even just human compassion to understand the importance of these things. And, you know, moms above all else are moms are superheroes. My mom's got five boys. Like I get it, you know, and so yes. it can be a zoo. And so really moms give up everything. They sacrifice and will do anything for their babies. And 
it's interesting to see in nature how different species even like i sent my wife a video and you know we're both watching this thing tearing up this little dog it's an old pup comes out of a dog house and sees a little baby chick wandering by itself it scoops it up and takes it in and tucks it into its warmth inside of its little dog house and Aww. it's just right it's just the sweetest thing and it's so beautiful to see nature take care of each other and moms to take care of other moms with things like breast milk and donation when there's excess and it's just really amazing and such a, a great gift to be able to give another baby. It's as powerful as being a bone marrow donor or a blood donor. It really does make a difference in the rest of that baby's life as they grow to become adults. Absolutely. And I know some moms who've experienced loss that chose to pump and donate their milk as a gift mm -hmm. and a way to work through their grief. So yeah, wow. it's very beautiful. That's amazing. I love stories like that. That's incredible. For sure. So you had mentioned, you know, that you wouldn't directly work with breastfeeding moms, but for someone who has finished their breastfeeding journey or was unable or chose not to breastfeed, what can our listeners do to improve gut health postpartum is a final question before we wrap up. Sure. And that's as you're actively breastfeeding? As you've completed breastfeeding or for mm -hmm. listeners who are not choosing to breastfeed? Yeah, great question. And I want to be careful not to deter women who are actively pregnant or breastfeeding. To, I don't want to deter you from seeking help either. Rare circumstances in digestive disease where we still can help and get things reduced or at least cover some basics and give your body some basic nutrients to help heal or try to get ahead of the curve. Because obviously there's breakdown. We want you trying to recover as much as you can. Give your body a tool to try to keep ahead of the breakdown. So I don't want to discourage you from getting help. It's just that to clean toxins out of the body and kill off gut bacteria and fungus and overgrowth that can be very dangerous. But for those who are done breastfeeding or choosing not to breastfeed in, in your postnatal, taking care of your guts, obviously very important. And the number one thing we want to do is look at the roots. And this is really my qualm, my challenge that I have with Western medicine. I've had, it's been a huge blessing to be able to work with doctors in this space who are in the functional medicine or their doctor ego doesn't get ahead of them because a lot of doctors will just, nope, this is the protocol. This is what we do. The protocol, what they do, unfortunately, is we assess your symptoms. With those symptoms, if you check all the right boxes, you get a diagnosis. If you don't check all the right boxes, you're kind of left in limbo like, well, we don't know what it is or there's nothing wrong with you. We call that medical gaslighting. And they just send you home and offer you antidepressants. And so we see that all the time. Sure. And so if you don't check the boxes, you're kind of hoop. If you do check the boxes, great. They give you a diagnosis. That diagnosis just attaches you to drugs A, B, or C. We give you these medications and it masks those symptoms for this diagnosis. And a diagnosis, we often attach to it and go, okay, well, I have IBS or I have Crohn's or colitis or whatever it is. And so unfortunately, that diagnosis really doesn't mean anything. All it is in the medical system is one word that quickly helps a medical professional understand what's going on in a snap of an instant. Okay, you have colitis, here are your symptoms. And now I know what's going on with you. But we attach to these diagnoses and say, well, there's nothing we can do. It's autoimmune, it's idiopathic, it's whatever, which I say is asinine. You know, looking at the ulcerative colitis space, for example, or Crohn's disease, looking at inflammatory bowel, they say idiopathic, no known cause, or it's genetic or maybe environmental. But either way, take the drugs and hope for the best. And this is where Western medicine goes so wrong. Even looking at the data, you know, we have, we've grown between one and a half to two million, give or take, cases of inflammatory bowel disease worldwide since 1990 to seven million today. So we've five X'd the amount of bowel disease in the world in the last 30 years. And 50% of that. The United States of America is 5% of the global population, but they have 50% of those diseases. And we're still saying it's idiopathic. Well, if 5% of the world has 50% of the problems and you tell me there's no known cause, you better figure it out. And if it's oh, just right. genetic, right, that is a statistical improbability. It can't happen. And so we have people worsening these gut diseases from what might be 72% of Americans complain of gut issues, being constipation, diarrhea, gas, pain, bloat, whatever it is, at least once a week. That is a open door. That is a gateway disease process to inflammatory bowel disease or whatever else. And we know the gut is connected to 93% of the leading causes of death in the USA. And that's everything. We're talking heart Ooh, disease, cancer, huge. Alzheimer's, huge, liver, diabetes, kidney, all kinds of issues that we see in the States. Gut issues are directly connected. And so the question is, what do we do or what can we do? Well, number one, you have to get ahead of this thing if you're on that slippery slope because we look at it as a severity spectrum. So right now you're wearing a pair of shoes and you're not wearing socks and you're a little irritated. Your foot might be red or raw or blistering. 
great. We can get ahead of it and put socks on now, or you can keep waiting till it's bleeding and raw and you've worn down to the bone. And now there's a lot more recovery process. And that's really how we look at these disease processes worsening over time. And so if you can get ahead of it now, if you just have gas or bloat or something else, seek someone out. I mean, I do work all over the world, but if I'm not a fit, some people hate my personality. That's fine. Go see somebody else who can help you, but I just care you get better. We just want you to get ahead. Gas and bloat or acid reflux is an early warning sign something else is going on. If you have acid reflux, I hate antacids. They they make it worse as far as I'm concerned. If you have bloat, digestive issues, IBS, IBD, get a stool sample done. Look at your gut bacteria. Seek an expert who specializes in these gut bacteria to actually help you rewind and reverse and rebalance. Again, I'm very careful with who I work with gut bacterial issues because, you know, like we talked about, but there's always a way to reverse it. Like inflammatory bowel disease, I talk about it because it's a severity spectrum. It's the 12 out of 10. It's as bad as it gets. It's crippling. It's the worst next to bowel cancer. But on the low end of the spectrum is bloat. And so sure. you have the potential to get worse. And if you don't get ahead of it, you can have a lot more cleanup to do down the road. But even those cases of IBD, they are very reversible. The Western world says it can't be helped. Your doctors will give you a diagnosis and give you drugs, but they're not looking for the roots as to why this got here. And so your gut issues come on in two ways. One, it's a slow wear and tear. Something happened like that rub, that wear and tear of a heel in a shoe. Or two, it was an insult like antibiotics or a flu virus or a disease. Something happened, food poisoning, and you've never been the same since and it got worse. That's an insult. So that's the only two ways we really get these diseases. Genetics are a very small component. So my advice is don't let your doctor just give you medication and send you on your way, chalk it up to genetics or say it's not known. Every symptom, every disease in the body is a symptom of dysfunction. We can simply correct that dysfunction. Your body will heal itself in every right. instance of almost every single disease. And that's where I'd like to leave that one for you. I love that. Yeah. Finding the root cause versus just treating the symptom. And you had mentioned, you know, even like skin issues. So I was having like breakouts and didn't, was trying to, you know, change products, get facials, you know, see um, my dermatologist and so on. But it mm. ended up being after I spent all of this money on product changes and so on, it was a, a food, it was allergy related mm. and, you know, I had blood work done. And so, and certainly gut health was also a factor. So once I made changes, I was able to see immediate improvement when I had been struggling for so long. That's amazing. It can be so easy, right? Like something like the skin, we go to a dermatologist who gives you cream for the skin, but your skin right. is a detox organ. It's a direct outside reflection of what's going on inside and your food allergies created leaky gut, created inflammation in the system that came out in your skin always has a root. Exactly. So how can our listeners find you, Josh? Well, Kristen, it's just like you said earlier, the best way to find me is on Reversible, the Ultimate Gut Health Podcast. And they said it's spelt reverse able, A-B-L-E, the Ultimate Gut Health Podcast. And we have the absolute pleasure of dealing with all things gut. And it's not just about our guts itself, but we talk about all the things in our world that affect our gut, our food, nutrition, stress, lifestyles. And we have had gynecologists on and, and OBGYNs and all kinds. We've had all kinds of different specialists and doctors. And we talk about how our gut influences our world, how our world influences our gut in long interviews like this, about an hour. And we also have short, quick 10 minute tips that you can always write in. And if you have questions, you'd like more information, head to reversiblepod.com. And there's contact information, there's free stuff. We actually have uh, free gut health programs for acid reflux and fatty liver, irritable bowel, SIBO, the works you can find there for zero charge. My goal Love here it. is, yeah, my goal is just to make this information free to the world. And I believe it should be so. That's amazing. Well, you are a wealth of information. I see you're also on social media between Facebook and Instagram. That's right. That's at joshdeck.health. Excellent. Well, I'll have to have you on again, Josh. It was so wonderful to uh, chat with you today. It was a pleasure, Kristen. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Ask the Doulas. For more information about Gold Coast Doulas, visit us on our website, goldcoastdoulas.com. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and give us a five-star review. Thank you. Remember, these moments are golden.